Hello, and thank you for joining today's Nile webinar. This is Lisa, the Education Manager for Immunize Nevada, and I will be today's moderator. Before we get started, I'd like to review a couple of housekeeping items. Please locate the chat box in the bottom left corner of your screen. If you have any questions, type them into the chat box, and we will address those questions throughout the presentation. A little disclaimer, Immunize Nevada's Nile webinars are made possible by the generosity of speakers who donate their time and expertise to benefit the coalition. The expectation and goal is for community partners to gain knowledge on immunization-related topics through a non-branded, unbiased presentation. Um, and just again, a real quick reminder that if any reason we do get disconnected, please call right back and we'll pick up right where we left off. And I'd like to turn it over now to our speaker today. It's Dr. Daniel Garbawi, who currently serves on the Clinical Affairs Team for Securist. And uh, Daniel attended pharmacy school at Albany College of Pharmacy, completed a residency in drug information, health outcomes, and policy research at the University of Tennessee and St. Jude's Research Hospital, and has worked intimately with the influenza, meningococcal, rabies, and Japanese encephalitis vaccines. All right, I will have you take it away. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, good afternoon, I should say. Uh, my name is, like Lisa said, Daniel Garbawi, and uh, today I wanted to uh, briefly speak about, it will switch for me, uh, protecting older adults from seasonal influenza, addressing the challenges in understanding immunization options. Uh, today we'll be introducing the adjuvanted influenza vaccine as an additional option, especially in the older adult population. But primarily uh, we'll be talking about uh, epidemiology, and what the true concerns are for this older adult population, introducing immunosenescence, uh, and uh, talking a little bit about how we can address these issues. The presentation I'll be giving today is going to be of uh, a more uh, conversational type. Uh, hopefully this is one that you feel comfortable interrupting at any time uh, with questions. I can uh, briefly hold in between uh, a few areas to, to allow for questions, but feel free to interrupt at any time. So let's briefly start with the epidemiology of influenza and how it affects the elderly. The flu has an incredible impact on all age groups in terms of outpatient visits, which can be nearly about 20% of all presenting patients in the ER during flu season, of which many of those who present uh, can be hospitalized and ultimately would lead to death. However, just the impact on days of productivity loss accounts for about $10 billion in economic burden globally as well. And here you'll see that across all of these endpoints, those who are 65 and older are most affected by the flu. The rate of hospitalizations for influenza-related illness increases dramatically with age, and the highest rate occurs in those 85 and older. Influenza-related mortality is also highest among individuals age 65 and older with a rate of about 22.1 deaths per 100,000 year, person years in this group. So we're seeing a disproportionate uh, effect on those who are 65 and older. And so we need to start focusing on how this is of a concern and how we can address that. Looking forward in terms of the flu itself, looking at strains, in this 12-year sample, type A was far and away the most infectious of the two types and this is typical for most seasons. And in some, including 1999, 2000, 2003, 2004, and 2009, you'll see that A was nearly all of the detected influenza infections. This isn't to discount B. As you can see, uh, in some years, B has a significant effect. However, in the elderly, we see that H3N2 uh, is the most common strain, uh, especially in just older adult populations as a whole. And as we'll discuss shortly, H3N2 is generally considered the most severe of the influenza strain types. Here is evidence to support that. Through another sample greater than 20 years, H3N2 was attributed to most of the flu-associated mortality, of which a majority of them were again in this older adult population followed by a smaller but still significant rate of B and H1N1. Focusing here on H3N2, we're seeing it being one of the most predominantly um, concerning strains that we'll see, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more about where H3N2 may affect us here shortly. But in summary, 
Influenza A is the predominant strain during most influenza seasons. H3N2 is the most virulent of the three seasonal influenza strains, followed by B and then H1N1. The AH3N2 accounts for the majority of influenza-associated hospitalizations and deaths, and H3N2 accounts for the greatest disease burden, again, um, compared to H1N1 or B, uh, with more rates of hospitalizations and mortality. Now let's take a moment to review the effects of aging on immunity and the challenges we have overcome. There are several contributing factors behind why older adults are most at risk. Uh, the first has to do with immunosenescence, or the body's gradual deterioration of the immune system, compounded with the fact that older adults typically have several chronic condition conditions and comorbidities. The next is that the match between the circulating strain and the vaccine strain may not be entirely perfect. Even when a match is perfect, the virus can mutate, and these antigenic shifts and drifts may render a vaccine ineffective. Another is that conventional influenza vaccine's effectiveness in and of itself, uh, in and of itself is um, not perfect. Although they are exceptional products and uh, across, a, across a broad population, they are very effective. Uh, their protection may not be sufficient for the older adult population. And finally, this group can present with atypical symptoms or um, the absence of typical symptoms such as fever and may not seek medical attention until it's too late. And this is why with, when a patient appears and who's hospitalized, um, who may already be uh, frail or have additional comorbidities, uh, those are the ones that we're seeing the highest uh, burden of disease in both uh, hospital presentations as well as uh, eventual deaths. So it's up to us to remain vigilant to monitor this group and fill the unmet need of a vaccine that can broadly protect uh, this age category and help protect us against influenza infection. So looking at what impacts uh, the infection can cause and what we are looking to accomplish here, uh, patients who already have a waning immunity and have comorbidities are now increased, have an increased susceptibility to infection since their immune system is not 100%, and they are of an increased severity of infection, which leads to increased risk of hospitalization, greater risk of disability, reduced quality of life, and increased mortality rates. If we focus on the individual sites at which our body mounts an immune response, we see how age-related degeneration leads to immunosenescence. And this is the largest concern. Now, we've been studying this quite a bit, trying to understand as to why um, a, a, someone who has progressed in age, uh, their immune system has significantly decreased. And so a few mechanisms of action have been uh, determined and who are believed, at least, um, these, are, these are theories. Um, the main uh, the main we'll talk about is the thymus, but if you look at the site of injection, uh, local responses are impaired because the, there are functional defects in antigen-presenting cells. In, thymus, in the thymus, we see thymic involution, which you see over here. As we progress in age, the uh, medulla and the cortex, which are heavily responsible for our naive T cell production, are severely reduced as we progress. And this leads not to just a reduction in the innate immunity, response, but uh, primarily our adaptive immunity, which are, is our best defense mechanism against infection. In the lymph node, we're seeing reduced B cell production and function. This assists in uh, producing antibodies. In the blood itself, we're seeing reduced diversity of immune cell repertoire, uh, mainly our natural killer cells and macrophages. And in the bone marrow, which are producing our uh, plasma cells, we're seeing reduced survival of those plasma cells and short duration of immunological protection. Now, if we focus on just our adaptive immunity, here you'll see how, as we age, our T cell, uh, our naive T cell production uh, is reduced, followed by our total immune function here in red, and our memory T cells begin to increase. So that shift from naive to memory T cells um, is predicted to be what is the strongest uh, effect on our adaptive immune system. Uh, this is dangerous simply because the memory T cells are largely ineffective against new or slightly different influenza virus strains. So although we do have memory T cells to assist, uh, as we progress in age, those are not necessarily as effective as our naive.
Now look at the vaccine itself. Here we see an age cohort of effectiveness for the conventional influenza vaccines. Uh, this simply supports our concerns that in the older adult cohort, those age 65 and older, have a varying degree of protection that is simply insufficient. Another concerning issue here is in our younger children, which should also not be ignored, as they are also disproportionately affected by influenza. Now, if we were to break down immune response by strain, we have further evidence of this concern. Uh, I'll focus on this top chart right here. The, uh, looking at what we understand of the epidemiology of the flu, you're, you're seeing that H1N1 uh, is being protected here in zero conversion rates, H3N2 much less, and B very little. Now, we know, what we know of the B strain is, is that older adults and most adults are not as affected uh, by the B strain as they are by the A strains. However, it's still a concern. And if you look at total seroconversion across multiple strains, uh, we're seeing that it's reduced. Uh, most older adults are not seroconverting whatsoever to any strain, um, and uh, much less three. So the more strains we put in there, uh, we put in the vaccine, the vaccine itself doesn't necessarily get a better response for us. So in summary, we, when we factor in immunosenescence, risk of comorbidities, higher susceptibility by this population, the issues with the conventional vaccine, and strain matching, we have a perfect storm of issues that need to be addressed by specialized vaccines. So now let's talk a little bit about Fluad and um, the, uh, the adjuvanted vaccine itself. Uh, the, the adjuvant that we use, MF59, and how that aims to support this group. Uh, I'd like to highlight in this presentation the terminology and acronyms used differ slightly than what is currently in the MMWR. So just to clarify, I use the term TIV for the trivalent influenza vaccine, and the uh, adjuvanted vaccine is ATIV, whereas in the MMWR it's IIV3 and AIIV3. So this is the influenza vaccine right now, the injected influenza vaccine, this is the adjuvanted influenza vaccine as listed in MMWR. My objectives here are to introduce you to Fluad, uh, the first adjuvanted influenza vaccine. It's currently approved in 38 countries, including uh, 15 countries in the EU for those uh, 65 and older, and um, has quite a bit of data supporting its immunogenicity and safety. Now, I mentioned MF59 as an adjuvant. Adjuvants as a whole, um, what is important? Why are, they, why are they necessary? Well, we're trying to accomplish a few things. We want to enhance the immune response in individuals who are currently have a naive or weakened immune system since they respond less well to vaccines. Vaccines themselves are based on purified or recombinant antigens. They can produce a suboptimal immune response. The antigen may not exactly match the circulating influenza virus strains. What we know of adjuvants is that they're intended to produce also broad immune responses. And then the antigen may be in short supply. So uh, when we're dealing with less antigen, we want to produce similar or stronger immune responses so adjuvants are capable of producing. So the adjuvant in question here is MF59. It, is, um, it has been approved for use since 1997. It is a, termed MF59. It's an oil and water emulsion composed of squalene, which is stabilized. Uh, the stabilizers are between 80 and span 85. But squalene here is the, the terminology that you may be hearing quite a bit. It's, um, it's not new. Um, it's biodegradable, biocompatible. Um, we produce it currently in our liver. Uh, we synthesize greater than a gram a day. We have it um, in dietary sources uh, for the vaccines produced through um, through sharks, actually, in the biosynthetic pathway, a single dose uh, contains approximately 10 milligrams. So it's something we see naturally in the body. Daniel? Yes. I just want to ask, um, interrupt. We do have a quick, a quick question. Um, mm -hmm. It says, if a patient gets a monthly immunoglobin in infusions, do you recommend the flu vaccine? So the answer to that question um, has to do with uh, vaccines as a whole. Um, the, the concern in the past had always been about live uh, live attenuated influenza vaccines, which, uh, which have issues with that um, because of the fact that those immunoglobulins can attach to a live uh, vaccine or a live uh, virus 
um, with killed influenza vaccines, this is not too much of an issue. So there is no contraindication to use in those patients. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So moving forward past the adjuvant, we'll talk a little bit about uh, this mechanism of action. Uh, it's been studied quite a bit, um, 20 years of research uh, looking at this adjuvant as well as other adjuvants. So this is uh, not specific to MF59, but this is the belief proposal, or this is the proposed mechanism of action for uh, MF59 as well. Uh, when it comes to it, uh, the purpose of an adjuvant is just to elicit a stronger response. So in combination with the vaccine antigen, uh, it's injected into the muscle, uh, their resident macrophages and dendritic cells are recruited. They induce chemokines, which uh, result in an influx of the phagocytic cells, such as your monocytes and neutrophils, uh, which take up the antigen. They differentiate into antigen-presenting uh, cells, which then uh, uh, lead to the thymus, where we're seeing T and B cell-mediated antibody production. Now, when it comes to what we know of uh, experience with the adjuvant, specifically with uh, this adjuvant, MF59, it's been around for quite some time. We first saw it in clinical trials in 1992. It was approved in 1997 in Europe. Uh, there has been um, quite a bit of, of study in terms of doses administered, 87 million uh, worldwide. It's currently approved in Canada in pediatrics, and it was approved in 2015 in the United States. You may not have heard much about it uh, because it hasn't been um, primarily uh, presented until recently. Uh, very little available at the time, but uh, you're, you're likely to see quite a bit more of it as it's been um, approved by uh, not just the, the FDA, but has um, been recommended by the CDC as well. So with that being said, let's introduce the influenza vaccine itself. Uh, the vaccine contains a half ml dose in pre-filled syringes contains about 15 micrograms of the hemagglutinin, which is uh, the same as what you would see in a typical vaccine. Um, and it also contains the adjuvant MF59. It is in an inactivated influenza vaccine indicated for active immunization against subtype A and B. It's approved for those used and for those who are 65 and older. And the approval is based on immune response listed by FluAD and the data demonstrating a decrease in influenza after vaccination is not available. This is known as an efficacy trial. Uh, the vaccine has effectiveness trials, which we'll discuss a little bit later. And some important safety information, which you're going to see with um, all vaccines, not just uh, influenza vaccines, is that it's contraindicated in patients who have had a severe allergic reaction to any component of the vaccine, including egg protein or after a previous dose of influenza vaccine, and those who have uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome in the last six weeks, uh, the, the doctors should evaluate whether um, the benefits outweigh the risks. The tip caps of the pre-filled syringes may contain rubber latex, which can cause allergic reactions in those who are very uh, latex sensitive. Um, questions about that, uh, I do know that come up, are whether those come into contact with the vaccine or whether that's a true concern. The tip caps do not come into contact with vaccine. They're removed before uh, adding an, a needle to the syringe. So, the, um, the, the theoretical concern about this is one that should be uh, evaluated by each healthcare provider individually, but um, the vaccine does not come in contact with that natural rubber latex. And the most common injection site reactions um, are, uh, are just those injection site pain and tenderness. Uh, those are typically mild and transient in nature. And the most common systemic effects were myalgia, headache, and fatigue. And of course, this is necessary for me to discuss before we move forward at all, but uh, long story short, this isn't uh, new to the vaccines as a whole. Now let's talk a little bit about the clinical data for FluAD. This is where I get a little bit more excited as a pharmacist. So this is uh, the part where there are quite a bit of questions, but feel uh, free to interrupt. I'll actually stop a few times during this to allow for questions. But in, um, in brief here, outline of what has been studied, uh, there are quite a few studies, and this is our clinical program for FluAD, so you'll see quite a few large studies, and we'll break those down as well in terms of what, uh, what clinical data we see around an adjuvanted influenza vaccine. So let's jump right into it. Here's some of the immunogenicity data. This was the landmark trial by Frey et al. The study was conducted in 2010 and 2011, and it broke down the, the patients whether they received an adjuvanted vaccine or a trivalent influenza vaccine. 
What's important to note is that this study was also a consistency analysis. So patients were broken down one to one to one to make sure that the lot to lot consistency was the same. But for all intents and purposes, just consider it a one to one comparator adjuvant vaccine versus trivalent influenza vaccine. The primary objectives were immunological equivalence, a non inferiority against all three strains. And then the secondary objectives were superiority. Uh, against heterologous strains and the strains that were in the vaccine, antibody persistence, clinical effectiveness, and then the safety assessment. The seroconversion rate is where we, we're going to start. So we'll talk about both seroconversion and the geometric mean titers. Based on this data right here, you'll see that the vaccine actually uh, produced a larger seroconversion rate across all three strains. But we'll look at it slightly different here, different view. You'll see that it demonstrates, again, higher values. So this dashed line right here is uh, the equivalent. And if it were to fall on the right, these points falling to the right, leads to uh, a favoring of the adjuvanted vaccine over the trivalent influenza vaccine. Non-inferiority bound was at 10% difference. So within negative uh, 10% uh, produces a non-inferiority. And per the FDA, um, the superiority was set at 10%. So you'll see here that the vaccine favors uh, the, the adjuvanted vaccine, the, the points favor the adjuvanted vaccine. And the only strain that actually produced superiority here was H3N2 at 13.9%. Now looking at the geometric mean titers, we're seeing similar results. H3N2, all the H1N1 and B strains, we're seeing larger um, uh, values here and favoring towards the adjuvanted vaccine. Uh, similar results, but here at one and a half fold is considered superiority. So it was able to achieve superiority for the H3N2 um, and then non-inferiority for both H1N1 and the B strains, but still favoring the adjuvanted influenza vaccine. For those who are in heterologous strains, um, for those wondering what heterologous means, that means that these are the strains that were circulating that were not in the vaccine itself. Uh, this is important to note because, simply put, uh, the, the strains shift, they drift. Um, we hear this quite a bit. Uh, how do we protect ourselves and how do we provide a broader immune response? Well, we wanted to, um, to test that with the adjuvanted vaccine, and as you'll see here, it does favor the adjuvanted vaccine, um, especially in the H3N2 strain. In the B strain, we're seeing non-inferiority as well. Now, that data is, is useful. However, um, one study does not sufficiently tell the story. Um, in 2008, Ansaldi uh, shows the, the vaccine strain here to the far left, the Wyoming strain, and these three strains were circulating, but were not protected against. And uh, at one here is where the, uh, the, vac the trivalent influenza vaccine, the conventional strain, uh, conventional vaccine pr produced uh, protection. Above that were the adjuvanted vaccine protection uh, in immunogenicity. So the GMT ratios were much higher for the adjuvanted vaccine. So we're seeing similarity here. And then looking at an additional study, the micronutrialization study, uh, looking at active antibodies against the strains. The, here in this 14-15 uh, season, the Texas strain was the one that was included in the vaccine. The Hong Kong was what was circulating. And you'll see here 40% uh, larger. So uh, the heterologous strain achieved nearly a three-fold zero conversion rate as compared to the, uh, the homolo homologous strain, excuse me, against the conventional influenza vaccine. Any questions at this point? This slide right here is fairly important in terms of persistence. We understand that uh, with influenza vaccines as a whole, and one of the issues that we're seeing with uh, vaccines is persistence in terms of how long after administering the vaccine is protection provided. This is of particular importance in the elderly population. We're seeing that the antibody rates can reduce significantly uh, over time. And so there's quite a bit of data out there that suggests this. And um, to overcome this, there are quite a, be, a few feats, um, quite a few issues, especially uh, with, with overcoming that, uh, that persistence data. Uh, the adjuvanted vaccine here shows um, some important uh, information at day 22, 181, and 366, so about a year out. Uh, it consistently favors the adjuvanted vaccine for the homologous strains. These results are uh, consistent with the heterologous strains as well. So uh, we're, we're trying to protect 
patients by giving them the vaccines as early as possible. And when the flu season hits late, there still may be protection uh, included with these vaccines. Now, that may not just be it. Um, it's not just one study. Uh, we're seeing a lot of this data in terms of the improvement in seroconversion rates and geometric mean titers across several studies. Uh, this is a meta-analysis of 16 randomized controlled trials of over 11,000 subjects, and it's supportive of the same observations in both seroconversion and GMT rates. So how does this apply to our real-world usage? Uh, we mentioned the fact that efficacy was not included, um, but effectiveness data is out there. And uh, for those who, who uh, need a refresher on this, the, the efficacy is an analysis of results under ideal circumstances in a clinical trial, whereas effectiveness is in real-world clinical settings. Um, we currently have the influenza vaccine effective ne effectiveness network here in the United States, which is integral in detecting ineffectiveness of um, vaccines and uh, was the responsible party behind uh, why the live attenuated influenza vaccine was seen to be ineffective. So critical information in terms of not just clinical trial data, but real-world data. And having seen that, uh, this study right here, the Lombardi Influenza Vaccine Effectiveness, or LIVE study, evaluated uh, patients across three seasons, 2006 through 2009 in Italy. Subjects received either a single dose of Fluad or a trivalent influenza vaccine, again, the adjuvanted or trivalent influenza vaccine. Um, but they received it in an interesting form. Um, they received it according to what the local, regional, or national influenza vaccine policy, policy recommended at that time. So there was no necessarily random assignment. It was give the vaccine to those who uh, needed the vaccine. And so we'll talk a little bit about what that um, has on an effect. Uh, but this was a, um, a study that uh, attempted to estimate the risk of hospitalization for influenza-related pneumonia and or influenza-like illness. These were not laboratory-confirmed cases, so this is not a, a test-negative design. But we'll talk a little bit about that later as well. Daniel, we Let's have one other quick question. Yeah. Um, any studies that um, are comparing Fluad with Fluzone? Uh, Fluzone high dose, I'm assuming? I'm not uh, sure. There are no studies that compare those two products. No, not currently. Okay. Uh, there are perceived to be studies to uh, present uh, the comparing, or the, I guess the comparing quite a bit of data between them that, that are potentially um, uh, due for results soon. However, nothing, nothing at the moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, so just really briefly, uh, what this study aimed to, to produce was whether patients were likely to be hospitalized um, and whether the vaccine, the adjuvanted vaccine, would be possibly capable of preventing a hospitalization. Well, like I mentioned, uh, it included um, what the regional or national immunization recommendations were, and in, in, in Italy at the time, uh, higher risk patients were recommended to receive the adjuvanted vaccine which results in about a 17% higher risk for hospitalization at baseline in that group. Uh, that's, that's a difficult thing to overcome. But despite the fact that there was a 17% higher risk of hospitalization, the vaccine was still capable of producing a 25% reduction in risk for hospitalization. Um, typically, you, you won't see a lot of this um, in, in terms of uh, uh, success factors, but uh, in real world application, this is important. But um, what I can say uh, the criticisms of the study have been were, are we truly seeing case negative controls? Are we seeing that the, the patients who received the vaccine weren't already positive for the flu? And so this introduces this second study, uh, second effectiveness trial that is a test negative design, it's a case control study in 2011, 2012 in Canada uh, that aims to accomplish um, what, uh, what criticisms of the last uh, uh, study had. And so in uh, this study, uh, it looked at patients who were not just in, let me take a step back here, not just in um, community settings, but also in long-term care facilities. They either received the adjuvanted vaccine, the trivalent influenza vaccine, and then were compared against unvaccinated patients. So in this study, we also see some positive data. Um, the vaccine effectiveness was 58% for the adjuvanted vaccine, where the trivalent influenza vaccine was ineffective. The relative uh, effectiveness of those two um, was 63%. So the adjuvanted vaccine was considered to be 63% more effective than the trivalent influenza vaccine. 
And then when you break out the population, um, the long-term care patients who are already at higher risk, if you were to take those patients out of the study um, and evaluate just the, the community-dwelling patients, um, you're seeing an increase in the vaccine effectiveness up to 72% when the trivalent influenza vaccine was ineffective. So a lot of positive data here in this study as well. So in conclusion, in terms of the effectiveness data, uh, we're seeing that the adjuvanted vaccine was estimated to have reduced risk of hospitalization in patients um, 65 and older by about 25% relative, relative to the conventional influenza vaccine. And in the other study, we're seeing a 58% effectiveness in preventing laboratory confirmed influenza, whereas the trivalent influenza vaccine was ineffective. And then looking at additional analysis, 72% effectiveness over the trivalent influenza vaccine. This is an additional um, slide just breaking down. Um, when we start to combine data, uh, this poster was being presented in Canada over a three-year period. Uh, still lower numbers, but in 2011 to 2014, when comprised, we're seeing slightly larger, um, larger numbers in the adjuvanted vaccine in terms of vaccine effectiveness. This confidence interval is very wide, though, so keep that in mind as well. A lot of this data is still to be analyzed. So we'll see if, if this can actually translate into some additional data as well. And then lastly, we like to combine uh, all the current pooled vaccine effectiveness, looking at flu ad across the board, uh, looking whether we're talking about uh, influenza-like illness, uh, pneumonia, and um, uh, acute coronary syndromes, and evaluating where vaccine effectiveness has been beneficial for the adjuvanted vaccine. So this is continuing to, uh, to grow, but from the pooled vaccine effectiveness across uh, 546,000 person seasons, we're still seeing positive data. So in summary, the uh, pooled effectiveness data shows that despite potential negative confounding in which the vaccine was preferentially used in older, more frail adults, including residents of long-term care facilities, the vaccine demonstrated robust vaccine effectiveness and is effective in reducing influenza-related outcomes in those older adults, particularly in hospitalizations due to influenza-related complications. And then let's evaluate really briefly here some of the safety data, because what good is a vaccine if it's not safe? Well, when we look at the pivotal trial, uh, you see here that the um, Adjuvanted versus the inadjuvanted vaccine, non-adjuvanted vaccine here. 95% of patients completed the study after a full year of observation. About 1% of subjects died during participation. About 1.4 to 1.5% of subjects experienced adverse events. 1% across the board. Serious adverse events were comparable. Across the board, we're seeing here very comparable data. And we are seeing a slightly increased amount of the adjuvanted uh, solicited adverse events. So let's break those down. There were two types of solicited adverse events, the local and systemic variety. Um, when you look at the uh, local adverse event reporting, it was low. Uh, more prevalent events were pain and tenderness uh, at the injection site, and reporting rates were all higher in the adjuvanted group. And this is to be predicted. Um, somebody had mentioned to me in the past that if you look at adjuvanted vaccines, they're creating a both immunogenic and a reactogenic response. Um, it should be proof that the, uh, the vaccine is working in those situations. When you look at systemic adverse events, they are all, again, mild to moderate in nature, transient in nature, typically resolving within 72 hours, uh, very similar to what we're seeing in the trivalent influenza vaccine across the board. Now, when you compare that also to the, the serious adverse events, uh, this is another one to be concerned. When you look at the trivalent influenza vaccine, uh, you actually see that those numbers trend uh, more in the trivalent influenza vaccine than the adjuvanted influenza vaccine. This is encouraging, uh, but again, this is non-significant across the board, so it is comparable. Now, when you pool that across 15 different randomized controlled trials, uh, you're seeing the same amount of data. In fact, we're seeing that FLUAD is just slightly lower, but the percentage is still non-significant between the two of them. Um, the most common adverse events were nasopharyngitis, injection site swelling, fever, and dizziness. Now, when we look at the serious adverse events, 
Again, the results similar across vaccine groups, no differences between them. In fact, when we evaluate uh, the safety of them across five randomized controlled trials, the study subjects here, uh, you'll see serious adverse events uh, being similar across the board. Um, you might see here a slightly larger number of deaths. They were not attributed to the, uh, the, the vaccine. Um, clinical characteristics of the deaths do not show a causal relationship to the vaccine. And although this number um, is a little bit higher, this is following revaccination attempts. So year after year after year, the numbers um, were reduced. So it's, it shows slightly higher, but this is insignificant when evaluated. In fact, uh, when you look at what our ongoing post-marketing surveillance includes, about 20 years of experience, 87 million doses administered, uh, there appears to be no safety concerns to, um, that, that are specific to adjuvanted vaccines. Uh, or this specific adjuvanted vaccine, at least, um, that are novel to any influenza vaccine. Uh, when we look at typical pharmacovigilance, you're monitoring for autoimmune disease, signs of hypersensitivity, or serious adverse events with vaccination. None of those have been admin uh, none of those have been have been seen at this time. Any questions? Okay. This slide's uh, presentation of the spontaneous self-reported adverse events. Uh, this is something that you would see in the uh, prescribing information as well. These are, again, voluntarily reported against a population of uncertain size. It's not really possible to estimate frequency or causal relationship to the vaccine here. So in summary, in terms of the safety uh, and including what we know about H3N2, it is associated with higher morbidity and mortality than the other subtypes, particularly in the adult, uh, the older adult population. And uh, FluAD elicits a, res a robust immune response compared to the standard conventional vaccine. And especially in the H3N2, where we saw superiority, FluAD has an acceptable safety profile with 20 years of post-marketing experience. And it demonstrates consistent enhanced effectiveness in the live and uh, Canadian comparative study. With that, I'd like to open it up to questions. OK, great. Um... Thank you so much, Daniel. Um, before we do say goodbye, we'd like to offer a little bit more time for last minute questions. Uh, so please type those in the chat box now. And while we wait for people to type in, just a couple of announcements. Um, our December, December denial is gonna be about vaccine hesitancy. So please join us in December. We won't have a denial in January, but then in February, we're gonna have an adult immunization summit, which includes uh, four to five different webinars that all take place on one day. So be looking for more information on that. Uh, if you would like to view or share this webinar, the recording will be available on our website along with information for future webinars. So please visit immunizenevada.org backslash webinars for those details. And we'll just give people a couple more seconds to type some questions in here if they have them. Your presentation was great. Thank you so much. That information was really helpful. Thank you. Let's see if anybody has any. Okay, I'm not seeing any here. Is there anything else that you'd like to say? Oh, we have a thank you. <laughs> thank you all for, for your time. And truly, I, I think what's important to note here is, is that uh, vaccine, vaccinations, immunizations as a whole, which I, I know that this group I'm preaching to the choir, uh, are, are critical. We already see that they're, they're very highly effective. And I don't think that uh, the intention of a presentation of this type is to say that they are not good vaccines. I think it's more about the fact that we need to highlight what the next generation of vaccines needs to accomplish. Um, and I don't think that it stops here. Uh, as, a, as someone who believes passionately about this and who has worked in vaccines for quite some time now, uh, I, I believe that uh, this is just the first step to, um, I guess, the, the, the next frontier. And so uh, with the hypervigilance of the group that I'm speaking to, to all of you, and um, with hopefully the continued efforts of whether it's the manufacturers or uh, the government. And in terms of uh, research, uh, I hope that we can accomplish uh, uh, an elimination of uh, the concern of influenza and its burden uh, in the near future. I absolutely agree. All right. I don't see any other Thank questions Thank you so much now. for your time. Um,
Yeah, and if anyone does have any questions, you know you can always reach out to me and I can get you in touch with um, Daniel um, any questions that are more specific. So that concludes today's now webinar. Again, thank you, Daniel, and to those who joined us today. Um, have a great day, everybody, and happy holidays.